Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ronnie Panoy, and I am uh, one of the producers at the Producer Hub, and my pronouns are she, her. I'd like to start with a acknowledgement first of the land and people we're supported by today. Um, I'm personally calling from the lands of the Shikori, Eno, and Tuscarora people, uh, which is colonially known as Durham, North Carolina. Uh, StreamYards, the platform that we are using today, and which we love, uh, is headquartered in what is now called uh, Tualatin, Oregon, on the traditional lands of the Atfalati and Kalapuya peoples. We acknowledge the lands the StreamYard resides on because the work that we're creating together now, this past year, and future, um, that work that we create on a digital platform does not exist in an ether or an imaginary void, um, but is made possible because of physical land and the indigenous peoples who steward it. Um, and I also, also want to give out to a shout out to Groundwater Arts, uh, who um, was really part of framing um, this practice of naming um, uh, the indigenous peoples whose lands um, they are stewarding that support our digital platform. So thank you, Groundwater. Um, I also want to start by um, sharing that, as you might see, we unfortunately um, do not have ASL right now tonight. Um, unfortunately, we had. Um, uh, plan to have it, but are having a little bit of uh, difficulty reaching our interpreter. So if um, I wanted to let you all know that in the recording, um, we're going to be working definitely to caption, and we're going to also see if we can add um, ASL as well to that recording uh, as well. So um, just to let you all know for those of you who are looking for it. Um, so I'm joined at the Producer Hub by my wonderful producing partner, Sophie Blumberg, who's uh, working behind the scenes tonight. Um, and for those of you joining the first time, the Producer Hub is a connective space for those working in live performance, and we uplift the work of the producer. Um, besides these webinars that are also available on YouTube at any time, uh, we have a wide array of resources on our website, which is producerhub.com. Uh, so we encourage you to sign up for our mailing list to stay posted on all our upcoming events. Um, and if you're watching tonight, we're thrilled to see you here. Thank you for sharing your Thursday night with us. Um, and just on a personal note before we dive in, um, as we all know, producing requires uh, versatility and flexibility. Um, one of the things that um, brings me to the lands of the Atafalati and, uh, um, or I should say the Shikori, you know, and Tuscarora people, um, is that I'm here caring um, for my mother-in-law and there was not really reliable Wi-Fi at where she lives. So I'm at a local brewery tonight hosting this webinar. And sometimes that, that is what producing means. So if um, you lose me for a minute, I will be back in a few seconds. Um, our amazing panelists tonight know this. Um, so thank you for rolling with the punches of uh, producing in this time. And uh, we're really excited to dig into it. So uh, tonight we're gonna talk about mentorship. So um, producing is a bespoke practice, right? Everyone develops their own way of doing it. This makes learning how to be a producer tricky. There's not one book. There's no one way of approaching the work. Um, and in addition to this, many producers often work in isolation from each other, making it challenging to build relationships and create opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning. So this is why a lot of folks at every stage of their career turn to mentorship. Um, it's been a big part of my career and a big part of my life and, the, and how I'm here running this webinar tonight. Um, so we're really excited to talk to different organizations around the country and individuals who are developing mentorship programs, who have experienced mentorship firsthand, um, that are going to share a bit about their philosophies and, and thoughts on this. Um, and to help, you know, those of you thinking about mentorship, um, think about what are the questions you may want to consider um, when thinking about a program or joining a cohort, um, no matter where in your practice you are. Uh, so with that, um, I want to, um, uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists shortly, but first I want to say, please be sure to um, use the chat uh, throughout if you'd like to ask a question to um, any of the panelists. We're going to save the last 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A, um, but it's great to know in advance um, what your questions might be um, so that we can, um, you know, kind of be primed and ready to go at that point. Um, so with that, I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists, uh, Miranda Goh from Theater Producers of Color, Leah Harris from the Theater Leadership Project, uh, Jamil Jude from Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Company. So if we could get our panelists in the room, that'd be great. Hey everyone, welcome. All right. Hi. Yeah, 
Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just uh, jump in, but please feel free um, after I give the kind of first prompt to take a second and introduce yourselves and whatever else you'd like to share um, with the full group. Um, so our first question tonight, um, mentorship can be so beneficial for producers in building their practice, um, but it can be tricky to find that opportunity or tricky to find a good fit. Um, so I'm hoping that each of you can share a little about three things. So A, um, being the mentorship programs you're affiliated with, uh, B, being what inspired their creation, you know, why this mentorship program now, um, and then third, how you define mentorship, because I think it's one of those words that can mean different things to different people. Um, and so Miranda, um, would you mind starting us off? Yeah, for sure. Hi everyone, Miranda Go, she, her, hers. I'm calling in from the lands of the Narragansett peoples, also known as Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I am the founder of Theater Producers of Color. Um, and that is a brand new organization that just got off the ground earlier this year in December. Uh, so the mission of Theater Producers of Color is to create greater access to education, training, and mentorship uh, to the next generation of BIPOC producers. Um, and my reason for founding Theater Producers of Color was because as an aspiring lead producer in the commercial world, um, I found that it was very difficult to, first of all, learn what a producer was and how to become one. Um, there aren't really a lot of formal programs out there that teach you about producing, and those that do exist um, sometimes are really hard to get into, um, either because of cost or because you need to know someone. So I, um, I, uh, so. Um, I wanted to address that challenge for folks uh, historically from underrepresented communities in getting access to those opportunities in professional development. Um, so my uh, that's kind of a long-winded backstory, but that was my reason for founding Theater Producers of Color. And our main initiative this year was to launch a 10-week Producing 101 course uh, that introduced a group of 25 aspiring producers to the nuts and bolts of commercial producing. Um, so this cohort uh, was made up of folks from all different backgrounds, um, some folks who have worked directly in the theater, some folks who have never worked formally in the theater but have always been fans of it and have wanted to find a way to get their foot in the door. Um, and over the course of the 10 weeks, uh, we met with different leaders in the industry, from producers to general managers to attorneys to speak on a different subject. Um, so the idea was that uh, over the course of 10 weeks, this cohort of 25 aspiring producers would kind of learn what it takes to become a commercial producer and how to get their career started. Um, so that has been a really fruitful endeavor, especially since we've been uh, in a shutdown this past year. Um, I think this it's one great thing that has come out of the pandemic is that folks have the time and space to kind of focus on ways to improve our industry, um, that we're seeing a lot of that work from Leah's work and Jamil's work um, and everyone at the Producer Hub. Um, but I, I think in terms of mentorship, what's great about theater producers of color is that um, a group of really hungry, ambitious, and curious uh, emerging producers um, all of a sudden get introduced to some of the top leaders in our industry um, and get to hear firsthand about their journeys and their career trajectories and how they approach the craft of producing um, in their own lives. Um, so I think it, it has been a really um, enlightening experience to see how folks have continued to cultivate those relationships um, and use it for the next step in their careers. Um, I don't know if I miss anything from that three-part question, but that's kind of uh, an introduction to theater producers of color. I think I think you did it. And I mean, I think in the way that you describe theater producers of color, you kind of baked in a lovely 
definition of mentorship in a way. So I think you did it. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, Miranda. Um, and uh, Jamil, could I throw it to you next? Yeah, sorry, I have to put my glasses on so I can actually see the mute button. Uh, hey, everyone, uh, Jamil Ju. Uh, like Ronnie mentioned earlier, I, I'm the artistic director at True Colors Theater Company in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, what is colonially known as Atlanta, Georgia, but I am zooming in from Atlanta, Muskogee Creek. I use the he series of pronouns. Uh, when I think about uh, mentorship, even I think about early mentorship for me uh, came through the Allen Lee Hughes Fellowship at Arena Stage where um, I was really um, lucky to get my first experience inside of you know a regional theater, predominantly white regional theater, and I recognized that that has impacted and shifted the way that I've moved through the American theater, both as a uh, now a leader of a culturally specific and Black arts organization, but also prior to that um, as a person of privilege with that privilege, but still inhabiting a black body. Um, I think that has been a, a huge aspect of the way I sought mentorship, mostly looking for other people of color who have navigated the same uh, treacherous waters uh, as I have, and also um, the ways in which mentors, regardless of their racial, ethnic, identity, identity writ large, have worked with me as being my mentors in some ways, uh, not having a similar cultural experience has caused friction, but also has provided me like uh, opportunities to analyze blind spots and maybe the, my own way. Um, I love listening to Miranda talk about um, how the work that she's doing in this mentorship, this peer group for uh, producers of color, like, you know, not only learning the ropes, but also providing like uh, peer to peer mentorship. And I think for me that that's probably been the biggest thing that I've experienced right now, especially as a young artistic director. I'm in my second year of artistic leadership. I took over in 2019, August 1st, 2019. So the bulk of my artistic leadership time has been in the pandemic, but I've been really fortunate to have several circles of artistic directors that we've been able to provide some peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. And I think that's where a lot of it has worked. But because of how I have been poured into, I've tried to create a space at True Colors where we are providing more mentorship for young Black artists, especially for them to feel like True Colors is a place that they could own as their own, um, let me try to stay away from that language, that language of ownership but that they can feel like they are included inside of the work of that organization um, and that they have space and a home there. And we've created a couple of early career opportunities and I try as much as I can uh, to avail myself and I know the rest of the staff at True Colors does similarly to avail ourselves to people who would like to know more about it, uh, who just don't know where to start and who weren't, um, who didn't get that opportunity to get dropped in at the beginning of their career inside of an institution that um, had been doing that for 60 plus years. I hope that answered your question, Ronnie, and I apologize. This <laughs> no, I think you, you, you really took a holistic approach to it, which I really, um, I really appreciate both in terms of how your experience of mentorship and, and the way that that has shaped your lens into how you look at the way that True Colors is leading its mentorship programs now, that all wraps up, I, I think, really beautifully. And, and just to say, I think that True Colors is very lucky to have you in, in the, you know, sitting at, in the lead these last two years in particular. So, um, yeah, what a year. Um, so, Leah, I want to throw it over to you next. Um, if you could speak a little to those three questions. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Harris. Um, I use she, her pronouns, calling in from the traditional lands of the Wichita Cato people known as Dallas, Texas. Um, and I'm the program manager for um, TTLP, Theater Leadership Project. And I'll kind of start a little bit uh, 
and talk about kind of the inspiration of it and then um, go into kind of what 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 it is that we're doing and in, in terms of mentorship. But um, TTLP was the idea for TTLP really started with um, two producers, Barbara Broccoli and Leah Volick, and they came together um, almost about a year ago in the wake of George Floyd's murder and really started asking questions about how, you know, they can use their, you know, influence and privilege um, to think about changing um, leadership on Broadway and changing the systems that, you know, allow leaders um, to, to be in, in positions of power on, on Broadway and really just thinking about just changing leadership in general on Broadway. Um, and so um, that idea has been baking over the past year and we officially launched about a month ago, a couple weeks ago actually. And um, we are supportive of BIPOC leadership within the commercial space, but specifically we're looking at administering fellowships for black individuals. So our first cohort of fellows will be black individuals working across um, leadership positions. So we're looking at creative producing, general and company management, and stage management. And we're doing that through partnerships for creative producing with the Prince Fellowship out of Columbia um, and with Black Theater Coalition on general and company management. And our approach at really looking at changing um, what leadership looks like is through sustained long-term funding and investment in these individuals. So these are three-year fellowships and the idea is by the end of it, um, it's a lifestyle and a, a career that they wanna sustain and we're looking at permanent job placement for these individuals. So um, by 2024, we're hopeful that, you know, that face of leadership will start to look different and just be more reflective of the world that we live in. Um, and I think a huge part of this work since it is a three-year commitment is the mentorship and is the community of support that we have around these fellows. So we have an advisory council that are advisors to our founding producers and myself as the program manager, um, but also will be mentors to our fellows as well and really tap into their um, networks and resources. We have advisors that have a myriad of experiences across theater and Broadway and that can really tap into their networks to really make sure that our fellows have a community that they want to, again, sustain in this, and, and sustaining this, life, sustaining this lifestyle. Um, and so that's something we're we're really intentional about and really thinking about outside of the work that they're doing, what is it that we're able to provide in terms of support for a community? Um, and what does that mentorship look like? And what does that peer to peer mentorship look like? Um, our fellowships, we're only gonna be having about a fairly small number, a manageable number, that way they can really have that, they can have opportunity to build community within themselves. Um, so that's TTLP. Um, the third part of the question, Ronnie, sorry, remind me. Oh, oh. yeah, no, my pleasure. So this is basically, <laughs> how do you define mentorship? Right. So for me, I when I'm thinking about mentorship, I'm thinking about relationships and I'm thinking about um, the relationships that you're making a commitment to for um, your your growth and your you know career path. I think um, one thing that Jamil spoke to earlier that resonates with me is that when I'm seeking mentorships, I really am seeking someone that shares my identity, right? So someone that is a black woman that I can really, really relate to on that level because I think it's a very specific path um, that black women have to navigate in, in theater in general, in you know systems, all systems, right? So I really do look for my experience and my identity to be um, reflected in that. Um, but really for me, it is about, you know, cultivating a relationship with someone um, and really going on a journey with someone and um, having also someone that holds you accountable, right? Um, and someone that is really invested in your growth. And I've been really fortunate to have people that have really been, you know, invested in my growth and that have really helped, um, helped me along the way. No, that's really beautiful, Leah. Thank you. And and actually, I want to kind of dig deeper in the direction you're already going um, with the with our next question, which is really, you know, what constitutes strong mentorship to you? And like, what is a good, if, if you know, if this is then this is a question for all of you. Like, what is a what is a good experience of mentorship look like for you? Um, so I don't know, Leah, if you want to talk about you know with some of the amazing mentorship experiences you've had in the past, what makes them you know so strong. Yeah, I think one thing that um, has, again, you know, having that, having my, you know, identity reflected has been really important, but also I have been, I feel like intentional in the last couple of years of um, seeking mentorship outside of theater and outside of this discipline um, because I, because that has, that has, um, 
that I feel like has helped me just become a more well-rounded person. Um, and just really thinking about, you know, how outside of the work that I'm doing in theater, you know, how I'm nourishing my whole self. Um, but I ultimately think, again, I think for me, it goes back to the relationship and the commitment that I'm making, not only for myself, but also the relationship that I'm building with my mentor, right? And someone that has been committed to my growth. And I think the the best thing that a mentor has done for me is, and this is so cliche, but has just told me that I could do it and has told me that this is something that I should, that I, that I could absolutely obtain. Um, and I mean, sometimes it really does take someone that sees something in you that you don't even see in yourself telling you that you can do it to really make you do it. Um, and I think that has been that has been a huge part of just of my story and of just how I've been able to put myself out there because I've had people that have believed in what I can do and have just been really invested in my growth. So I'm invested in that relationship as well. That's great, Leah. I mean, I, I really love the the relationality that you're really pointing to here that I think a lot of times when we think mentorship program, there's so much focus put on the skills and like the stuff that you're gonna get. But everything you're talking about, the um, having someone who believes in you, holds you accountable. I mean, all of that is so um, relational. So just wanna uplift that. Um, Randa, do you, would you like to share um, some thoughts on that question? Sure, yeah, I love what you said, Leah. Um, kind of having that emotional connection to a mentor as well who is invested in your development and really wants you to succeed i think first and foremost if you have that that makes a great mentor um, thinking about my past mentorship experiences some have been formal some have been more informal um, and i think that a lot of these programs that exist um, almost seem transactional at times, right? We talked about this in our in our prep call about uh, sometimes uh, there is a job description that comes along with the mentorship, um, which can be a good and bad thing. Um, but um, the mentorship programs that I've really enjoyed have allowed me to be very transparent about what I hope to one day achieve and what my short and long-term goals are in terms of my career. And if I don't yet have those figured out, um, someone who will help me kind of further define those. Um, but uh, some mentorship opportunities that have been great for me, especially at the beginning of my career, were those that allowed me um, to kind of just be a fly in the wall and to be a sponge and just absorb. I think a lot of producing is on the job learning and a lot of times you either make it up as you go as we all know or uh, we look at the producers in charge and kind of see how they make their decisions how they lead a room um, and are kind of a representative for the project so i think um a lot of learning in the producing environment comes from just observing and taking in what what you're seeing around you and seeing what's successful and what's not. Um, so I think being able to have access to uh, a producer's mind and how they make their decisions is, is really invaluable. Um, and then kind of more to what Leo was saying, um, uh, you know, as a woman of color coming up through the industry, um, there weren't a lot of opportunities, unfortunately, for me to receive mentorship from people who looked like me, who shared my identity. Um, but one thing that I really uh, value is getting, uh, getting the opportunity to work with folks who share the same values and, and kind of mission that, that I do in my own work. Um, so I think an example of that is when I was first um, even thinking about theater and whether I had a role in it, um, I saw like this fantastic off-Broadway production and I quickly looked up who the producers were. Sorry, that is uh, my mom on FaceTime. Um, but 
I, I saw this play off Broadway that I fell in love with and I looked up who was behind the team um, and I emailed them and uh, that was my first internship in New York. And um, I think the fact that uh, my reason for reaching out was led by um, artistry and by uh, kind of the material that I was responding to and that I saw myself in led to a really fruitful mentorship relationship um, and one that I still kind of look upon today. Um, so I think all of those things make a great mentor, but um, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. No, you did it. And actually, um, Bonus for Miranda, I think you also kind of moved into the territory of our next question, which is great because I think that this question and the next one um, are really closely linked, which is that, um, you know, and yeah, we did talk about this on the prep call of how mentorship programs can often be paired with or superseded by a job that you have to fill. Um, and there can be this tension between learning by doing and being low paid labor um, so actually, Jamil, and, and throwing it over to you, if you want to, I'd love to hear from you both, you know, what you experience as being strong or good uh, mentorship, and also this question about this tension between learning by doing and, you know, low paid labor, because I think that that can be so much a part of that equation, as, you know, Miranda kind of just touched on. Yeah, um, thank you for that. And um Miranda, uh, I know the tension of your mom being uh, trying to hit you up in the middle of the event. Uh, so please, from all of us, <laughs> tell her hello uh, when you talk to her a little bit later. Um, the I feel like a good mentor checks on you without you having to reach out. You know, I know that's so difficult, especially like you know for people when I call myself a mentor, just for me, just to remind myself like, hey, I haven't heard from X in a long time, I should go reach out. But um, what I think that's why I think that's valuable is sometimes, you know, you think that especially in the early part of your career that like, oh, the issues that I'm facing are so insignificant, so um, pointless to somebody that like, I can't go to my mentor with this thing because like, you know, they'll laugh at me or they told me a story already how they've already overcome this thing. Um, I, I don't feel confident that I can go to them with that, right? Um, and then when a mentor just reaches out sometimes, it's just like, oh, hey, this other person who... Oh, did yeah. anyone else lose? Oh yeah, you're back, great. I wasn't sure if it was just okay, yeah, me. Could you just say the last three seconds? I yeah, my headphone just came out. Let me see if I can switch it. I'm sorry. I'll try to vamp while I can. All right. Am I back? Can you hear me? You're back. All right. Great. Well, so I think what I'm saying is that like when they reach out to you, when a mentor just reaches out to you out the blue, man, it can just, it can give you a sense of relief. Like, hey, there is somebody else that's advocating for me. There's somebody else that cares about the things that I'm going to. I don't actually have to prejudge myself in the situation that I'm in because there's somebody else who cares and who wants to help guide me through this. Um, and it may be, it, even if it's not unique to them, it's unique to me. Um, and that can instill you with so much confidence. I think that there is a line um, to, your, um, to your point, Ronnie, about paid, low paid labor versus invaluable experience. I think I have worked best when my mentor wasn't also my boss, right? Like, um, because there isn't the expectation that keeping my mentor happy or keeping my job are one and the same, that um, I can go to them and talk through the challenges. If your mentor is also your boss and they are the one who is you know, maybe not creating the best space for you. How do you navigate that? Uh, I'll say, you know, I want to give a big shout out to Daniel Proxarnical, who was actually my first boss and mentor, Proxarnical, P-R-U-K-S-A-R-N-U-K-U-L. Um, uh, 
<laughs> for you, Interpreter Steve, because uh, it took me a long time to learn how to spell that too. But um, Daniel actually did a really great job. And I feel like he's been a better mentor to me after uh, my time working with him. Not that he wasn't great as uh, as a boss, but it was that experience afterwards that really helped grow our relationship. And it allowed that mentorship to extend beyond the work that I was doing on, hey, here's a way that you can do it better. It's like, hey, here's how you can position yourselves for the things that you have going on for life. Um, those times where I have felt most challenged in that mentor-mentee relationship have been the times where um, the the person that I was looking up to, especially in the early parts of my career, happened to be people in positions of leadership and them needing me to serve a specific role and my desires extending beyond the limited scope that they envisioned me for, right? Like, and that's not um, a, a fault to them because in a way they have a job to do, they have a theater to run, they have a department to run uh, and they need certain things to happen. But as my skill set changes, as my interests diversify, as I get opportunities from organizations outside of this one that is either paying my bills or that I'm being mentored inside of, like that that rub starts to happen. It is hard to cheer you on, cheer me on. Uh, I can imagine it's hard to cheer me on in my individual success when that may mean I am less available to you and your future projects. Uh, and you may then have to go out and replace me. Um, that When that starts to rub up against, I think that's where we have found the most interest. And I, I, I carry that forward and I try not to put too many mentor-mentee relationships with people who are, who are directly reporting to me um, because it, 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 it becomes very difficult to cheer for them and wish them all the best while also needing to hold them accountable for any and all work that they're doing in relationship to your company. No, I think that's really, I think you're really onto something with that, that it's, um, you know, I think in a lot of formal programs, there there's kind of an assumption that they're one and the same when the functionality of having a valuable experience and having a mentor relationship doesn't need to necessarily sit on right on top of another and can have, um, there can be really some inherent challenges with that. Um, and, you know, all of this, these conversations about, mentorship kind of sitting in a, um, I mean, a theme, themes that I keep hearing from this conversation is that it's someone who has a similar kind of experience, you know, similar identity, and you know, someone that has a real relationship of accountability and ongoing relationship that isn't one-sided. So this, this kind of is a nice, you know, um, way into the next question, which is, you know, what are some alternatives to formal mentorship programs? Because um, while, you know, I want to kind of shout from the rooftops about the mentorship programs that we're, you know, really lifting up today and encourage everyone, um, you know, who is who's eligible to, you know, to apply and take advantage of these opportunities. Um, that's not the only way to get mentorship. And you know, we talked a little in the prep call about how some fellowships can really be perceived as like fast tracks to, you know, to success or on some kind of ladder. And you know holding the values of um, access and of, you know, dismantling the systems of oppression that aren't serving us, you know, there's so many ways to, um, to find mentorship in, you know, in even in unconventional places. So I'm curious um, if you all have advice for the folks that are listening about if you're, you know, what are some alternatives to formal mentorship programs? And if someone is looking for guidance, um, where can they turn? And actually, Leah, I'd love to throw it to you first. Yeah, um, I mean, I kind of touched a little bit on this earlier, but I think it's, you know, really important kind of wherever you are to look at, you know, pillars in your community and think about, you know, where in your kind of day to day that you, you know, interact with people, whether it's, you know, in a library or, you know, wherever that is in your community that you can really, you know, just start to have conversations, just start to build a relationship with someone. I think, you know, I feel like as I'm, you know, getting older and ascending in different ways in my career and people are starting to 
come to me as, um, you know, wanting to have a, what I'm, you know, is what I'm getting as like mentorship and, but not really knowing how to have that language. It really is just coming out as just conversations about, can you tell me what you did like six months after graduation? Or can you talk to me about, you know, your first job? And can you talk to me about, you know, the first time you didn't get the job? And it's like, those are kind of the things that I'm starting, that people are starting to, you know, invite me into conversations about. And, you know, those aren't necessarily just people that are in, in theater, in, in, in the work with me. Right. And so, um, I don't know. And, and it's something that I'm also trying to do as well for myself of just, again, like I said, you know, finding, you know, outside of the arts and theater. And I, you know, I get that that's, you know, why we're here, but I think it's also important to talk about, you know, especially as a person of color and as a black woman, like, I just know that I have to be, you know, um, I have to be whole to be able to do this work and to hold all these things. And um, sometimes the the best way that I can fill my cup is to seek outside of what I'm already in every day, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I would just, I would really just think about, you know, who, who in your communities, who in your circles are people that you can just start having conversations with and, and, and organically kind of build some sort of um, rapport with and, and see where it goes from there, you know? And I think, again, as someone that is, that's, I, I feel like that's coming to me in, in certain ways right now and over the last year and something that I'm also seeking, um, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, kind of balance all of that. So, that, that's what I would say to that. No, that's great. And I, and my sense is too, is that there can sometimes be a perceived fear of, well, if I don't have some kind of deep relationship already with someone that I can't broach a, a you know, um, what would it be like to be in conversation? And, you know, is this something that would be interesting to you? And um, I'm always amazed at there is so much more goodwill than you often, you know, might presuppose as someone who's earlier or younger in the field that, folks really do want to be helpful, I think, fundamentally. Um, so it, it, it can seem a little strange, I think, to think outside the box, but I think you're right on that you have to, you know, to be okay with with asking the questions and doing that, um, that reaching out, you know, there's a real, um, an art to asking. Um, and yeah, and Miranda and Jamil, anything you'd like to add or I can I can keep going, but I wanted to give you space to jump in if you'd like on that one. Yeah, I just want to underscore like how crucial I think it is just to um, e e take take a risk and email somebody. The worst thing that you can get is a no, um, and the best thing you can get is someone who can be a future mentor. Um, I I know that my email gets slammed sometimes, but oftentimes you know, hey, like a persistent person, or you know, you get me on a good time. You say, hey, like uh, maybe over the, especially over the pandemic, so many like, hey, I'm a student here and I want to talk to somebody. Um, and I've been able just to, you know, have a 30 minute or an hour long conversation with people. Um, I think those things work. Also, I think let's take advantage of um, the tools that we have, right? Like what are our social media opportunities? Um, Instagram, Facebook groups, uh, where those things can take place. Uh, I, I think oftentimes we are made to feel as if we are undeserving or that it is inappropriate somehow. Um, like. Hey, maybe I'm, I'm, what I'm not asking for is unsolicited scripts, right? You know, or like uh, directing resumes. Like that, that feels like a different thing than when you're asking for genuine advice or guidance or something like that. Um, and I think some of that is just about what Leah said, and maybe Veronica, you spoke to it too. There's an art to the ask of guidance and mentorship and leader, you know, um, and, and seeking counsel. And I think you get better at it the more you do it, um, but there shouldn't be anything that really stops you. But maybe you don't need to be mentored by Oscar Eustace because there's somebody who is extremely talented in your community that might be a little bit more accessible to you and be able to provide you more specific information about where you are in your circumstance. Um, so yeah, sure, shoot an email to Oscar. Um, if he responds to yours, have going to respond to mine. But like, if you um, if you um, you know don't want to go just that route, uh, I think there are so many other opportunities for you to ask people. Yeah, go ahead, Miranda. I completely agree. I think, especially since it is so hard to get a formal education in producing. I'm a total fan of doing the cold email and, and 
making relationships that way. Um, I've spoken to someone on the subway who was holding a play below the show I just saw and she ended up uh, being in uh, the midst of lead producing her own stuff. So like that is one way that I've cultivated a relationship. But I think it's gravitating towards people who are doing what you want to be doing or um, are going through the same thing as you are. I think there is an issue of a lack of transparency in our industry about how certain things work um, and what really uh, it takes to be a successful producer um, in the commercial theater industry. Um, so when I think about what has been helpful for me, um, I think Jamil, you, you brought up peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. I'm a big fan of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Um, you know, when you're looking at different opportunities, who can you uh, lean on to say, um, I'm looking at this job opportunity. Um, do you know anything about the company? What's it like to work for this person? Um, one of my mentors has um, more than once said, I think, the pay is not good enough. I, I think uh, you're you're going to be working too much and it's it's too low. And I'm like, you're right. But <laughs> um, so people who are who are willing to be transparent with you and um, kind of be real with you, I think is important. Um, and especially as producers, when you're constantly learning new things every day, someone you can um, who you feel like you can send an email to or a text to and say. Um, something is happening in the production, uh, what, would, what would you do if you were in this position? Um, so that's what, that's what my advice would be. No, oh, this is amazing advice, I love it. And um, um, these conversations are making me harken back to um, a lot of conversations I've had with like, no, don't take that job, that salary's terrible. You know, it's, it's, it's really incredible to have someone who is, um, you know, keeping their eye out for you um, in the industry because it can be so hard to um, know what a good next step is because there is no one right path, especially for producing, and there's so many decisions to make about where to put your time. Um, so I, you know, we have, um, I want to encourage folks to drop any questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to just keep going until we get some questions um, popping in. Um, um, so please don't be shy, folks in the chat. Um, what I would love to ask, I mean, I guess speaking about choices is, you know, we talked a little about, about how to find um, a mentor um, and about doing that outreach, but, you know, how would you recommend young or new producers assess what kind of mentorship opportunity is right for them, you know, um, at an early stage in their career? I mean, especially for BIPOC producers, you know, what, um, what are some of the questions um, that, that folks should be asking themselves? Because uh, I think we all know that there is, not every opportunity is gonna be right for everyone. Um, and yeah, I'm curious, um, Miranda, if I can throw that, that question to you first. Sure, um, I think a good question to ask yourself is what, kind of leader you want to eventually grow into. Again, I think so much of producing is learning by doing and observing what makes a particular producer successful or not successful. Um, so for me, um, I've always tried to attach myself to those who share the same taste with me, but also the same personal values. Um, because frankly, that's not always the case. It's more often not the case. Um, so I, I think when you are looking at whether it's a formal program or um, looking at a, a new job opportunity, um, looking to see who you'll really be spending time with and learning from um, because you you absorb it whether you like it or not and that's kind of how you take uh what what you need to learn um from that experience so i think um when you're looking at different opportunities really finding those who who share the same values as you do yeah right on and um 
Jamil, I might ask you if you're willing to speak a little about, um, you know, the different kinds of pathways that you know you've experienced in your in your own life in terms of this. Um, you know, there is as much as we uh, hope that there isn't uh, the sense of the predominantly white institution PWI path, the um, leaders of color um, kind of path. Uh, there are ways that those paths intersect and ways that they don't. Um, so for, for younger folks um, or folks new to producing, I'm curious if you have thoughts specifically in relationship to, you know, to that part of your experience. Yeah, thanks for that, Ronnie. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I have perpetually felt like I have been playing catch up, right? Like not really studying theater in college made me when I got to the professional theater world, like, hey, I had to play catch up. And um, even now as a, leader of a black theater company, like I felt like there was a little bit of catch up that I had to play because my early experiences were by mentors of color inside predominantly white institutions. Um, what I believe, what I will, let me take that back. Let me say it differently. What I don't want to see is more producers, early career administrators, artists feeling like aligning themselves with the predominantly white institution is the only way to be successful. I say that because in having looked back on the first 10 years of my career, um, 13 years now, I feel that I, there are several ways in which the indoctrination that I experienced there failed me. You know, I spoke recently about how I was made to believe something that was untrue about the leaders inside of these institutions or about the way that change happens, that change can only happen slowly and that we can only let a certain number of people in because audiences weren't, wouldn't be ready for that type of transformation and the audiences. Like there's a lot that people of color are, BIPOC people, individuals are asked to assume as the truth about the experience inside of predominantly white institutions that makes their that makes them different producers. I was a I was one type of producer when I felt like my job was making space for BIPOC artists and stories inside predominantly white institutions to the first time when I was at True Colors and I was invited on stage in a and there's 320 plus black people here inside the audience to hear our story like i don't have to produce in that old way anymore because the old way was untrue oh i was fighting for 50 seats a tenth of the audience you know a small percentage of the audience so where it's like oh no it's the overwhelming majority of the audience and they're going to be here every night and it's not just because um the show fits any four criterion that we were made to you know believe inside of these other institutions. This is a long-winded way of saying as young producers, uh, especially young BIPOC producers, I want to encourage them that um, there is a mode of being, a way of being that um, you may have been born with and raised with and um, uh, the your early experiences have been needed in you uh, through your own like you know baking process, try not to go far with that metaphor because I'll get lost uh, as a non baker. But um, oftentimes those initial instincts get coached out of us. We are coached to be less loud, less informal, uh, frame our emails up in a specific way uh, that actually runs antithetical to the way in which our community wants to receive the art that we're making. Um, so think about the space you're being welcomed in and what they want to teach you if that aligns with who you are on the inside or if you're being asked to assume a different personhood in order to survive in that environment when that environment is definitely not has not proven that it is built for our success. 
No, Jamil, thank you for saying the thing. Um, and I appreciate all of your, your truth and vulnerability in this discussion because that's, I feel like that's so uh, present um, and something that just never gets talked about. So just thank you for sharing that. And um, I think I wanna kind of use, the, kind of bring that into um, our last question for tonight. Um, which is, you know, we've so far tonight um, talked about uh, mentorship as a relationship. We've talked about it as um, a way of, um, you know, aligning your values with folks who can be in relationship with you over time and to be the producer you want to be, um, about a way of being in terms of a, you know, who, who you're in relationship with and the behaviors and, um, that there's that there's choices, that there's opportunities, there's choices, and there's agency in this mentorship conversation. And I've been really inspired to hear your thoughts um, around that. Um, what I what I'd like to ask as the final question is how you all think mentorship programs can prepare the next generation not only to exist in the field as it is now, but to make the bold shifts we need in the face of challenges such as white supremacy, climate crisis, future pandemic. And, you know, of course, not every producer, not every theater is gonna handle all of those challenges. That's not the remit for an every single producer. But I think it's fair to say that the world we're in now is not the one we wanna be in. And, you know, how is mentorship in your mind um, a part of that? And, and how, how is mentorship, um, how is the challenge of, of mentorship kind of higher or, or different or, um, needs to be looked at differently in light of those challenges. Um, and Leah, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's important to name that there are, have been a lot of mentorship programs, you know, that have intentionally excluded folks of color, right? And so just looking at that system um, is really important. I feel like I've been you know, close enough to programs that, you know, I just think examining, you know, and, and just starting from a place of meeting people where they're at, um, because I think that there is a lot of, um, you know, legacy and history of certain programs get brought in. And, you know, there's a certain level of criteria or understanding of what the ideal candidate of this fellowship or program or whatever that is looks like. And I think, at least as a first step, just examining that, right, of just like what an ideal candidate is and what what kind of things you're centering in that criteria and, and how those are exclusionary practices that, you know, um, exclude black and brown folks. Um, but I think like, as just as a starting point, it is really about meeting people where they're at and understanding that if people are coming into a mentorship program, you have to account for their growth and you have to account for the fact that they're going to evolve and change. And I feel like I ha I know people that have been through programs and I've, you know, been, you know, in, in adjacent to programs where I feel like people have felt like they haven't been met where they're at, right? And that they're the person that they are entering that program hasn't really been honored. And so the growth gets a little stifled. Um, and, you know, I think ultimately you want to step out of a program and be able to look back and say and speak highly of the experience, right? And and acknowledge that there, you know, are struggles and whatever else, but you know, you want to be able to say like because of this time, this experience, this commitment, you know, I'm better in this way. But um all that to say, I I personally believe that like a first step is really just examining what it is you're centering in terms of, you know, how you get into these programs, what this ideal candidate is, but also really meeting people where they're out, where, where they're at at the moment and accounting for their growth moving forward. That's great, Leah, thanks so much. Um, I think that's right on in so many ways. Um, Miranda, um, do you wanna jump in next? Sure. Um, it, it's a good question that our, our team behind theater producers of color has been trying to think about lately. Um, I think a large part of mentorship is education, um, but the question is, how do you address educating this next generation of, of producers while acknowledging that some of what we're teaching has not historically been equitable 
or inclusive um, and that some of these systems are in fact kind of broken. Um, so within theater producers of color, uh, we're trying to hold space for uh, conversations uh, to occur that um, kind of challenge what has historically uh, been the precedent um, and kind of open the dialogue uh, to encourage thoughts behind how we can disrupt um, those systems in, in place. Um, so um, that's one thing that we've learned through theater producers of color. Um, you know, it's definitely the priority is to equip our cohort with the nuts and bolts of commercial producing and to give them the tools uh, that they need to get to the next step in, in their careers, but also um, making sure that we have space to kind of challenge those things. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I forgot the other thing I was going to say. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> if you think of it, we'll come back to you. No worries. <laughs> And uh, Jamil, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thankful for, um, you know, what has already been said. Um, and I, I really think it's about this idea of seeking and sharing, right? Like I think for the current generation of leaders, well, or, the, the people who currently hold leadership positions, because that's a multi-generational thing, what we can do is that we can share out the lessons that we've learned, right? Like events like this, uh, where providing, you know, we can create the platforms to share out what we know, but I think it's also about seeking what else is out there because, hey, like we may not know how to apply it, but if we go out there and seek it, if we are sharing what we know and we go out there and seek out what, what's best here, it's like, I, I can take this cog here and then I can say like, hey, y'all, in the past, we have done with things that look like this, this way. I'm now giving it to you and say like, hey, here's what it is. Like, and maybe you didn't know that there was a summit of other artists that were finding it out. And maybe I received an email that said, hey, there is a, an event happening on in two weeks, sending that out to the next generation, to all of the mentees, sharing it out on your social media platform and things like that by sharing what you have found out there in the world and how you just like putting people into place. I, I personally believe that like, if given space, opportunity, resources, uh, the chance to connect and the chance to breathe and think that they're not fighting for survival gigs, that the next generation actually will be able to figure it out. So what is that we can do? We can um, make sure that, uh, jobs, even if they are entry level jobs, are paid fairly. Uh, we can make sure that um, if we only can pay a certain amount that we make that commiserate with the amount of time that we are requiring for people so they actually get some experimental time. Um, and if we are providing people with the resources, the connections, the information that we allow them to draw their own conclusions because it is through their new systems of thinking that are different from the ways our brains have been wired and systems, uh, system approaches that they'll be able to address some of the newer issues. Um, and I think there's so many revolutionary things that are already happening that we need to acknowledge and hold on to, right? Like, I know that there is a lot of scuttlebutt about uh, the We See You White American Theater, but like the fact that that thing is being mentioned in every single article that comes out about change and revolution, about the American theater says something. So let's not um, let's not be so quick to dismiss some of the changes, like the fact that Ronnie, that uh, it is practice of Producers Hub to acknowledge for land acknowledgements, right? And that becomes something that we do more and putting our pronoun usage, like these things, like, well, let's not gloss over them. Let's just build on them. And I think we're doing um, the right things um, by putting people in place. And I think we can further lean into that by, um, you know, providing them more resources, be it pay, be it um, platforms or whatever, because uh, they'll start to draw new systems and new connections on the fertile earth. I believe we're giving them fertile earth um, that's out there. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Jamil. And and since we're at time, I'll, I'll go ahead and say thank you so much to the three of you. And um, 
and to Jamil's point about you know sharing and sharing your knowledge, thank you for sharing the three of you for sharing um, your information tonight. I'm I'm really deeply moved and um, uh, just uh, I can't say how much I, I believe in all of the efforts that you're doing in the places in the field where you're looking to make change. I think it matters so much, and I appreciate you being visible to the folks that are watching this to kind of see what the what the face of leadership um, look, you know, you, these three faces are pretty stunning to me. Um, so thank you so much for, for your time and for your expertise tonight. Um, so what I would like to say in closing, in addition to that, thank you. Um, oh, and I love that comment. Yes, thank you, Pepper. Um, so what I wanna encourage in the spirit of um, thinking about resources is that the Producer Hub does have a, a free series of like a database of resources for folks at any point in their producing practice from you know, books to read, articles, uh, we have a list of anti-racism and decolonizing resources, uh, a list of grants. So if you're looking for a place um, to build your own producing practice, it's, it's there, it's free. Um, reach out to us at Producer Hub if there are other webinars or other resources um, that you need. Um, we're really wanting to be receptive to what the needs are of producers in this moment. Um, so that's producerhub.org. Um, and please join our mailing list to hear about future webinars. And with that, um, thank you again uh, to our amazing panelists. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you.